to welcome the guys at River Bend, D. Berry, Tennessee Prison for Women. Come on, let's welcome them, church family. We welcome y'all. Thanks so much for being along for the ride today. I pray that this study through this book, have you enjoyed uh, reading through and studying through? I hope that it's um, helped us to gain a greater appreciation, um, maybe even served as a catalyst to dive more deeply into um, the scripture. And uh, I pray that you've been encouraged by this letter written by the Apostle Peter from a prison in Rome to a scattered, exiled, young, believing group of people in Asia Minor. And uh, you'll see that Peter this week is going to reiterate. We're in the final chapter, and we're going to be in chapter 5 today. And he's going to reiterate some of the themes that he's already introduced. But he also is going to address, right from the beginning here in chapter 5, he's going to address one group that he has not addressed yet in his, in his book. And uh, we've talked about submission in government and the workplace and marriage and then the body of Christ. And here in chapter five, he addresses a group of people and that is the elders in the church. And he's going to speak specifically to those that are in a position of leadership uh, for the church. We started in verse one of chapter five. For those of you that are guests, we um, each year we take a book of the Bible and we just take it line by line, verse by verse, and dive in as deeply as we can and uh, learn from it. So this is where we start. He goes, I exhort the elders among you. Now, now just so you know, um, elders, um, this does not necessarily mean older. It just means that they have a position of, of leadership. In fact, uh, in your soap reading yesterday and today, um, you, you got to read some of the qualifications and the parameters and some of the things that are expected of, of elders and people in leadership within the church. For those of you that are guests, we have a SOAP reading guide, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. And we read a chapter a day, and then we kind of recap it a little bit on the weekends. But you read through um, yesterday in 2 Timothy, and then today you're going to read in Titus some of the qualifications of these, these elders, not, not necessarily older but, but elder doesn't mean old man. Now, they could be older, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. What they do need to be is a person of wisdom and faithfulness, okay? And uh, you, you can read some of those qualifications uh, later today. But look, look at how Peter describes himself again now. As a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be uh, revealed. So he's dramatically, once again, as he did in his, his greeting, he's dramatically downplaying his role in the early church. Um, Peter was a pillar of the early church. Everyone would have known him. Um, and, and instead of leading with coming from the chief apostle and one of the three, I think you know who I am. No, he, he says, I, I'm one of you. I, I, I'm on the same level with you. And he gives them a present understanding of who he is. He is a fellow elder. And then he says, I'm also a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So now he not only appeals to his present state, but now he's appealing to something from the past. He starts with the present fellow elder, and then he goes to the past, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And he says, the reason I've been telling you to follow this example of Christ is suffering and to follow in that because you're joined to him is because I saw it firsthand. I was a witness to perfect suffering. We saw last week that Christ was perfected in his suffering. And he's reminding us that he was a witness to that perfection happening in the life of Christ. So he appeals to his present, a fellow elder, and to the past as a witness, the sufferings of Christ. Then, of course, you, you might guess now he then appeals to the future. And he says, I am a partaker in something that is going to be revealed. He points us once again to this future, living, abiding hope that's being held for us in heaven. And then he says in verse 2, watch this. He says, be shepherds. Be shepherds. I, I, I think that's an interesting image, of course, used all throughout Scripture. But I, maybe you've never asked yourself the question, why is shepherd the most appropriate metaphor for someone who leads the church? Well, a few thoughts on that, if I can speak into it just a little bit. Um, to be a, a shepherd, you have to commit to a position of humility. Uh, it's actually not a position of, of elevation. It's a, it's a low position. Uh, it's a position of serving 
not being served. And if you ever get around a shepherd who wants to be served rather than to serve, he's not really a shepherd. Okay, it's a, it's a low position. Here's another reason why I think they use um, shepherd, and maybe I can just have a transparent moment with you this morning. It's appropriate metaphor because um, being a shepherd is hard work, and it's often frustrating um, because you have to work with sheep. Okay. Um, and um, sometimes sheep bite. And they have the taste for shepherd. Um, <laughs> now, I, now, I'm not only a shepherd, but I'm also a sheep. So I, I understand that we all have the propensity to wander. Right? Isaiah 53 tells us that, that we, we like to go astray. We like to wander, which is what makes being a shepherd frustrating. Because sheep like to wander. I like to find their own field. Like, we're over here. I know, but I got a better one over here. No, okay. Um, and Peter has pointed out, we're given to our passions and our emotions rather than we are to being self-controlled and sober-minded. Um, let me just, one final reason I think um, shepherd is a great metaphor for leadership within the church is because it's a position also of influence. So yes, it's a, a position of humility, but it's also a position of influence because leadership is about influence. And those that have the opportunity to lead people are those that see it as an opportunity to steward the gifts in those people and to help them grow in those gifts. And when, when it's done well, you can actually lead a large group of people, all uniquely gifted in an orderly manner, following not only after what's good for them, but also what's good for others as they use their unique gifts. It's a position of influence along with humility can also be sometimes first. Now, it's, let me just say this, just, I don't want to be totally, it's also a position where you get to celebrate and see the victories that happen in people's lives too. It's the most fun thing in the world, everybody. So, um, you know, there's this story um, that bookends both the interaction that Christ had with, with Peter. You know, Jesus uh, starts out his relationship with Peter by this miraculous catch of fish where he says, you know, put the nets on the other side. And, and then all of a sudden some things start to click for, for Peter. And then at the end uh, of Jesus's time here on earth. There's also this other end where Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the dead, but he's not yet shown himself to the disciples. A and Peter and his buddies go back to what they know to do best. And that is to go back out on the boat and start fishing. And so they're back on the boats again. And um, someone calls to them from the shore. And he says, hey, cast those nets on the other side. And Peter immediately knows who it is. Why? Because uh, it says in John 10 that he, he's the great shepherd and the sheep know him and know his voice and they follow him. So he gets out of the boat and he starts running towards the shoreline. And there's this scene of reconciliation, this scene now where they're sitting around a campfire. The crackling of the fire still in his head from the last time he was gathered around a fire. And Jesus asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Three times, once for, for every betrayal. And every time Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And what is it that Jesus says? Then feed my sheep, care for my sheep, feed my lambs. He says in John 21, feed my sheep. Don't you know that that carried with him throughout the rest of his ministry and his life? He said, this is, the, my, this is my job. This is what I've been redeemed for. This is why I've been forgiven to feed the sheep. And that's exactly what he's doing for these young believers, these exiles. It's exactly what he's doing for us now, today. This purpose in writing the letter is to feed the sheep. And now it goes on to say in verse two, be shepherds of God's flock. I, I think it's interesting that it, it, he didn't say, be shepherds of your flock. No, we're shepherds of God's flock. Um, so just as he talked about being stewards of our gifts, he's now reminding us that we're stewards of, not owners of, we're stewards of his people. 
that he entrusts to us and we are stewards of the gifts that are in them and we have the privilege of leading them. He, he basically reminds us, hey, this isn't yours. This is yours to take care of for, for a time, but you don't own it, you steward it. So you're, you're not my people. <laughs> it's interesting when I hear pastors and shepherds refer to my people and my church and no, no, no. He entrusts to us the opportunity to build his, his church. It's his flock. And then Peter gives us three ways now in verse two and three, how we ought not to shepherd people. He goes on to say this, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them. Now three ways, how we should not lead when we're overseeing people within the life of church, not under compulsion, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to, again, it's a, it's a place of service, not being served, not lording it over those entrusted to you. Again, he's entrusted people to those and we're stewarding those people and the gifts that are in them, but being examples to the flock, not under compulsion. It's an interesting one. Why, why would anyone become a shepherd out of compulsion? Why would anyone feel so compelled to take the role of pastor or shepherd or elder? Or better yet, why would anyone stay in that? Well, here's, here's one that I hear a lot. Well, there was no one else. <laughs> it's, a com- it's actually a common thing I see in the body of Christ. Well, if I didn't, uh, I guess the Lord's calling me because no one else is stepping up. And sometimes if we just would have waited just a little bit longer, the person who truly was called to do that, um, again, we can't take on, well, if I don't do it, I'm, I guess I'm the only hope for the world. And... No, it's, it's God's flock, it's his church, and he knows exactly what his bride needs when it needs it, and he cares for the bride way more than we ever could. And he has someone exactly for that role. So we, we don't need people serving out of this guilt-based compulsion. We need people serving out of a joy-filled calling, okay? So we don't need people functioning under this burden. Oh, well, you know, it's part of the calling, well, maybe you're not the one to do it because what's a burden to someone is a blessing to someone else. Okay. So we don't serve out of compulsion. Here's the second reason he said to, to not pursue dishonest gain, he says. So we not only don't do it because we have to, we also don't do it because there's something in it for us. Whether that's financial gain or the approval of others or finding your identity in what you're doing or or status or position or title those are bad reasons to get into ministry um and then he gives us the last one not lording not lording over people in other words um not having a desire for power and can i just honestly tell you, Ashley and I have the opportunity to sit with people who have been lorded over um, and to walk with them through the healing process of hopefully experiencing healthy, whole leadership. Ministry should never be a power grab. Um, do, do this job if you want your life to preach the gospel. Um, it's a role of serving. It's a role of humility. It's a role of influence. And Jesus knew. Jesus knew it was going to be difficult. How did he know that? Because verse four says, he's the chief shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. Again, that will never fade away, referencing a crown that would have been given to those that competed in in races and competitions, and they would put a, a crown of laurels or leaves on their, their head, but it was a fading crown. And, and what he's saying to us is we, we actually will receive a crown that never fades by the chief shepherd, Jesus, appearing. Again, the, the word of the Lord stands forever. Remember, he reminds us of that, and the, the flowers fade, and the, the grass withers, but the word of the Lord stands forever, he told us earlier in his letter. And again, he pushes us back to the perishable versus the imperishable, and he says, we're going to receive a crown that's being held for us in heaven. That's imperishable, that's undefiled. Now look at verse 5. And in the same way, you who are younger, so now he is talking about elder and younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Um, In other words, don't assume 
that you're smarter than the old man. I mean, you're incredibly creative and brilliant, and, but just don't assume that you know a new thing that they don't know about. And maybe you, maybe you do know a new thing, but maybe you just need to wait, you know, because you probably do know something. You know, my daughter knows way more about my phone than I do. So I, something was going wrong with my phone the other day. I was like, something's going wrong with that. She took it. Here you go. It's fine. What in the, it's been that way for two months. What in the world? I, I should have just told you that. So there are certainly things that the younger generation and younger people know that we need to know, but it needs to be done with, listen, a spirit of humility and honor, not, a, not with the rolling of the eyes. Oh, jeez. No. What, Leviticus 19. Look at this. Stand up in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly. And, and look, when you do that, you actually revere God. So there's a connection in your reverence to God and how you revere and honor those that are just a little further down the road than you. So when you do that, there's something spiritual that happens. Of course, we live in the South. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. But we don't do that because we live in the South. We do that because we want to honor and revere God. There's a direct connection to that. You're on the tram. The tram's full, riding between gates at the airport, and the older person gets on. You get up. <laughs> you get up and you say, I have a seat for you that I've been saving just for you. I'd be happy to stand and hold the, like we just honor and why? Because um, there's a reverence to God when you do that. It's that there's an honoring. When, when they walk into the room, boy, this is just, I know I'm old school. When they walk into the room, a lot of energy. I know it takes, get up. <laughs> you get up. Yes, sir. Good to, good to see you. We honor, we revere. I would, I would encourage you, ask them questions and then listen. Mind the wisdom that's in them. Look at Job 12. Watch, look at this verse here in Job 12. Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? Get inside their minds. Get inside their heart. I promise you, if you do, you will learn something. Now, yes. You can certainly bring ideas to the table and suggest some things, but he, Peter's just reminding us what he's already told us. We do it with a gentle and quiet spirit, not a quarrelsome spirit, not a condescending spirit. Go back to verse five. Now, first Peter chapter five, verse five, look what it says. And in the same way, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you. Now he switches. Now he's talking now to the whole body of Christ. Now, all of us, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Um, humility is a rare virtue in our world today. It's um, something that when you see it, you recognize it because it is so rare. Um, meekness and not powering up on people. And Peter says we should humble ourselves in our relationships with one another. In fact, this humility before one another and before God, it's actually the position of greatest strength. There's strength in it. This, this phrase here, clothe yourselves. Here, here's what it means. It means this, to tie something onto oneself, such as a work apron worn by servants. Let me just read it. Okay, clothe yourselves. Here's what it means. To tie something onto oneself, such as a work apron, meaning you're gonna work, Worn by servants. You know, it's, it's, I can't help but think that Peter is reflecting back on an experience that he had with Jesus. You remember in his last night with the disciples, the last supper, it's the night before he would go to the cross, just four days after he rode into the city and he came riding in, celebrating, and now he's sitting around a table with his disciples, partaking the Passover meal. It's early in the evening and John 13 says that P Jesus gets up from the meal he took off his outer clothing and he, he clothed himself in humility. Jesus, he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. And, and he proceeds to wash the feet of the disciples. You know, what, remember what happens when he gets to Peter? You're not doing that to me. I mean, this, Peter, he's so predictable, isn't he? You're not doing that. And he basically says, you don't understand what I'm doing. And he explains a little bit. And then he goes from that to like, well, then just wash my whole body then. This is Peter. Like, 
He's like zero to 10. I mean, just back and forth. And, but you know what? He's like, Jesus basically says, I, I'm going to go lower than you. I'm going to intentionally go lower than you. And he models something for his disciples. He not only models humility and takes this posture of serving, but he also models this principle of making the choice to do something over and over and over again. Because, you know, washing of feet was something very common in these days. I mean, every time they would come in from being out and about, the servant would wash the feet. And what Jesus does is a demonstration of a regular, faithful, humble, repeated act of forgiveness. Because within the body of believers, what did Peter tell us last week? That we are to have earnest love one for another and cover each other, cover up to a multitude of sins. <laughs> so what does that mean? We're going to have to wash each other's feet. You, you know what? In order for us to keep moving forward in our relationship, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And you extend that forgiveness to me. And we, we commit to washing each other's feet. It's not just this act of servant. It's this act of ongoing forgiveness being in our relationships with one another because we're going to do things that need to be forgiven. Remember, there's a multitude of sins in the body. It's another reason that I think he, he tells us this story because there's, an other, there's another experience that Peter had with Jesus where he comes to Jesus and he says, Peter, uh, Jesus, how many times should we forgive someone? Now, Peter actually thought that he was gonna beat Jesus to the punchline here because what was taught in that day, here's what the rabbis taught. You, only, you, for, you had to forgive someone up to three times and then you were done. Okay, so when, when Peter asks the rabbi the question, how many times he thinks the answer that Jesus is going to say is, is three times. And so that's why he beats him to the punchline. He wants to be the straight A student here. And he goes, how many times should we forgive someone up to seven times? Straight A, you know, because <laughs> I've more than doubled what all the rabbis are saying. And then I, per I, I picked this perfect number. And then Jesus says, um, actually, um, 70 times seven. Um, what? Um, he thought he was going to impress Jesus. No, seven times 70. So what does Jesus mean now? Okay, well, we're going to start now. That's a lot of tallying. I got to do ooh, ooh, one, two, no. And now I start keeping track. Jesus takes the number seven, which is the number of completeness, and he pairs it with another number that symbolizes testing and completeness. Seven times 10 times seven. Completeness times testing times completeness times testing times completeness. <laughs> over and over and over and over as many as it takes. That's how many times you should forgive, Peter. How many know that's going to be a test? But by the way, if you know how many times you've forgiven, then you haven't forgiven. Jesus shows Peter this principle in the washing of the disciples' feet. We are to love one another earnestly and to cover. That's how we enter a posture of humility, serving, forgiveness. What? Look at this passage in Luke chapter 6. Watch this. Why do you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own life. Well, we just, let's just bow our heads and pray right there, everybody. I mean, that's... How could you say to your friend, here, uh, let me show you where you're way off, where you're wrong, when you are guilty of even more than they are? Goes on to say, you are overly critical, splitting hairs and being a hypocrite. You must, here it is, your posture of humility, acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them before you will be able to deal with the blind spot of your friend. Boy, it's just those blind spots are just so frustrating, though. It's that sheep thing all over again, isn't it? Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Look at this. Because of the grace God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest. This is where, this is where a lot of us get off track. We're not honest in our self-evaluation. Measuring yourselves by the faith that God has. You know, so much of humility has to do with self-assessment. 
accurate self-assessment and self-awareness. It goes on to say in the same chapter, look what he says in verse 16, the same chapter, live happily together in a spirit of harmony and be as mindful of another's worth. So we're going to, we're going to take the low position as you are of, of your own. Now, don't, don't live with, he says, watch, don't live with a lofty <laughs> mindset. <laughs> You're thinking yourself too important, but be willing to do the menial tasks. Let me tell you what that means. This is, this, is, this is great. It means to adjust yourselves to humble situations. Oh, man. Gonna, I'm going to adjust myself. I don't do those kinds of things. I, well, he, he's telling us that that's, that's what we're all called to do. We adjust ourselves to humble situations. And we identify with those that are humble-minded. Don't be smug or even think for a moment that you know it all. Which means you're going to have to choose to put on humility, to clothe yourself in humility. And it goes on to say now, verse Peter chapter five, verse five goes on to say now, clothe yourselves in humility toward one another because God opposes the proud. I don't think we, we fully understand the weight of that. Because if there's anyone that I don't want opposing me, it's this guy. Um, David, David wrote in Psalm 138, watch what he says. Although he is greatest of all, he is attentive to the humble and he, this is how powerful it is, he keeps his distance from the proud and the pompous. So you either choose pride or humility. If you want opposition and resistance and God to be distant, choose pride. But if you want to be close and you want the attention of God and you want the grace and the favor of God on your life, you're going to have to choose to go to the low place, to the places that require humility. P Peter is showing us what humility and submission looks like in this horizontal relationship one with another. And now he transitions to now what, it, what this submission and humility looks like in our vertical relationship with God. Look at verse six now. He goes on to say, humble yourselves therefore, based on what? Based on God opposing those that are proud and giving grace to those that are humble. Therefore, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Now, I don't know that phrase. I read it four days ago over and over and over again, and it scared me. <laughs> Do you know how much power is in God's mighty hand? And he says, you humble yourself un under that. I mean, there's something frightening, a little terrifying about the mighty hand of God. But then as I thought about it more, it was also incredibly comforting. <laughs> like the mighty hand of God is not only extended in strength, but it's also in care and protection. It inspires me with a holy reverence. And at the same time, it gives me the deepest security. David in Psalm 91, watch, watch what he read. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest, comforting, in the shadow of the Almighty, terrifying. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, comforting, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. Verse three, for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every deadly disease. And he will, I can cover you with my feathers. Terrifying, comforting. And he will shelter you under his wings. His faithful promises, I love this, are your armor and your protection. Everybody, come on, say amen to that promise right there. That's an amazing promise. And there's good news. On the other side of the choice of humility, on the other side of that, verse 6, humble yourselves, he says, under his mighty hand. There's good news on the other side of it. Why? Because then he will lift you up in due time. I love it. At the proper time. So in other words, my job is humility. My job is submission. My job is to faithfully keep showing up with the right spirit and the right attitude. That's my job. God's job is to bring the opportunity. Let me say it a different way. Hey, leave the promoting to God. Quit jostling for 
opposition and taking people out on your way and not earnestly loving people and covering them with a, no, no, leave, leave the promoting to God. And so Peter basically sets the expectation and, and the expectation, sorry, is open-ended because he, God gets to choose. It's up to him. I don't know. Um, if you're kids, if you have kids or anything like mine, but when your kids find out that you're going to do something special. This past week, we had a couple of nights where we were just going to do some things fun with the kids, and we didn't want to tell them what we were doing, so we made the mistake of telling them we were doing something. <laughs> bad, that's a bad parenting fail. <laughs> just keep it to yourself. Because then, it, Is it time? Is it time to go? Are we, when we do it, what are we doing? Is it, are, when, when is the something happening? How much longer until we go? Boy, um, how many of us are like that? Um, because um, when's the proper time? I mean, is it due time yet? I mean, I'm really humbling myself. So when's the due time? I mean, is, is it time yet? Are we going to do something? I mean, you're going to do something, right? And just the right time. At just the right time. At the proper time. Time, at just the right time, while we were yet sinners, God sent his son. At just the right time, a stone was rolled back from a grave and Jesus emerged. And at just the right time, Jesus ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And at just the right time, the heavens are going to crack open, everybody. And the glory of God will be revealed at just the right time. You see, submission and humility are represented in our ability to trust that God knows the right time. He's actually outside of time. It's just the right time. And then he goes on to spell out for us what this practice of humility and submission looks like in our vertical relationship. Verse seven, watch this. Cast all of your anxiety on him. Now, for those of you that have been uh, connect for any length of time, you know that one of my practices as I get close to the end of preparing for the weekend is to pray through, pray over the message and ask this question. Where, where is the moment? Where, where do I need to slow down and where do I need to be ever so conscious of the Holy Spirit wanting to say something? And as I was praying, oh, this is just my practice, there are, I believe there are many of you here that just need to tune in for me over these next really five to seven minutes because what's represented in, in a position of submission and humility, the requirement is to cast all of your anxiety on him. The, the literal translation of that word cast means, look at this, to hurl, to fling them off as though they are a heavy weight. It's not just like this, eh, just off. Love. No, it is, it's not this passive, disingenuous act. It is this authentic, meaningful act that is done with intentionality. I am hurling, throwing, flinging off my anxiety to the only one that can handle it. Now, if you want to know where you are trying to take charge of something, where you are carrying the burden, where you think you are the sovereign God of all the universe, here's where you look, your anxieties. What is it that you fret about? Because that's where you think God can't handle it. Our anxieties are the, are the calling card of our self-reliance. Prayer is the transference of the burden. It is an admittance of weakness. And our weakness is the very thing needed for the strength of God to be activated. And the best way to break an anxiety habit is by starting a prayer transferring habit. Casting, hurling, flinging habit. You're my provider. You're my protector. You're my healer. You're my provision. I'm coming to you and I'm putting the burden on you. Why? Because I was never designed to handle it. And if you want to know where you're stepping into the place where God should be, look to your anxieties. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 4. He said, do not be, there it is again, anxious 
Let me say that. Have no anxiety about anything. That word anxious and anxiety, it's synonymous with the word worry. It's this thought. I wonder if this is going to happen. Well, what if this happens? What if they find out that I'm ill-equipped and unprepared? What if they find out that I'm a fraud, that I'm really, what, 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 what if they, this is going to happen. I, and then your whole life is based on a thought that isn't even based on reality. So what's worry? Worry is borrowing from the future something that hasn't even happened. We pull it into our life. We pull what ha- hasn't even happened into our present. It's complete concern over something that either has happened and you can't do anything about it or something that hasn't happened and you have no control over anyway. And honestly, it's robbing a lot of you from living with this joy, living with peace. And that word worry, here's what it means, to choke or to strangle. Some of us, the, the the Greek actually goes even deeper and it means a divided mind meaning you know you shouldn't go there but you keep going there look what he goes on to say in verse six don't be anxious about anything but in every situation by transferring the burden by flinging by hurling the anxieties with thanksgiving present your requests to the only one that can handle it. In every situation, I thank you, Lord. You are bigger than my giant. You are bigger than my mountaintop. You're bigger than my sickness. You're bigger than my financial need. You're bigger than anything I'm currently facing right now. I'm just a sheep. I can't handle burdens. We're just sheep. We can't handle burdens, everybody. We think we can, and we try to. But we're, with thanksgiving, we bring our request to him. Now, if you ask me to do something, I'm, I'll be obedient to it. But in the meantime, I'm just trusting you, God. And then what happens then? Verse 7, and the peace of God, which is what none of us have. Hey, we, we sang it earlier. It's easy to sing. Love has a name. Joy has a name. Victory has a name. Hey, hey, look right here. Peace has a name, and it's not Devin. No, no. The peace of God, which transcends all of your understanding, will get you thinking right and living right out of this place. Everything flows from your heart, from the thoughts that you're having. Everything. The peace of God comes. So when I'm troubled and I'm upset, I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I'm doing what you told me to do. And I'm trusting you with it. And what that means is I'm not going to carry it anymore. Now, here's what we do, though. Okay, Lord, here it is. I mean, are you going to do anything about that? I mean, I put it there. So, I mean, it's right there. I put it, I I gave it there. Okay, it's right. God, it's right there. Well, if you're not going to do anything, okay, I'll just pick it back up. And a week later, we have no peace. Because we keep picking up the things that we're supposed to be hurling and flinging off. Jesus talked about this. He asks a great question in Matthew 6. Look, look, look what Jesus asks. Can any of you add a single hour by worrying? In fact, studies have shown you shorten your life by doing that. Jesus says, one of the problems with your worry is that you're thinking out of the moment. You get ahead of yourself and now you're borrowing from the future and bringing it into your present when you should be living right here, right now. And that, look, what, look how he ends this message in verse 34, the same chapter. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. There's enough in tomorrow. Be present today. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Today, today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Well, I wonder what's going to... And here you are. And tomorrow will be the tomorrow that you're worrying about today. And you just keep finding yourself in the same place that you keep worrying about. Well, what, what would life look like if you could live in the present? Enjoying the now. Like, don't add more trouble to your life. Here's what I wanted to say. I just, someone needs to hear this. Here it is. Live one day at a time. 
live one day at a time. And I know that's really simple, but we don't do it. Think of all your worry and your anxiety. So much of it isn't based on right here, right now. Enjoy it. Jesus is teaching us, even in teaching us how to pray. What did he say? He said, we pray this way. Give us this day. Give us today. It, so it's not supply all my, my needs till you return. No, today, I'm not going to try to fix tomorrow. I'm gonna, right here, right now. Don't let the thought of tomorrow ruin your today. Just think about, think about all that you're missing out on. Let me say it a different way. Stare at the blessing and glance at the pain. Like focus on the blessing and quit giving all of your focus to the pain and to the situation. And don't let the thought of tomorrow ruin your today. You can carry it or you can cast it. Carry it or cast it. Lay it down, leave it there. What, what, we, what do we used to sing? Uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we don't cast it. We end up carrying it. Well, Devin, I'm pretty sure my situation's different. Pretty sure I'm carrying more than anyone is carrying. And God would understand my situation because I have more than anyone in this entire room could carry combined. And he's pretty much forgotten about me. And that, that proper time has come and gone. Nope. Look at the rest of the verse. Like they, he says in First Peter, look at the rest of the verse. Oh, cast all your anxiety on him. Oh, because he cares. <laughs> he's present. He knows exactly what you're carrying. Cast all of your anxiety on him. And here's the second thing I just wanted you to live. For, and then just remember that he cares. He cares. You're not alone. Like remind yourself. There, there is no problem too big for God's power and no problem too small for his presence. There's no, there's no problem too small that he doesn't care about. And yet there's no problem too big that he can't take care of. He, you know what he's waiting? He's waiting for you to invite him into the process and for you to cast it, to fling it, to hurl it. Stop carrying what you were never designed to carry because we, we want to handle it. We, we want to control it. Um, we're sheep. I'm a sheep. I can't handle it. And now I know I'm alone in that, obviously. Like, well, we'll be praying for you, brother. I'm handling it just fine. Thank you. <laughs> Psalm 55, watch this. Psalm 55, pile your troubles on God's shoulders. I was, he can handle it. Broad shoulders. He'll carry your load. He'll help you out. He'll never let good people topple into ruin. Now verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 5. We're, getting, we're coming down the stretch. Of first, don't you love 1 Peter? So because of that, be alert and of sober mind. So he's going back to that thought he had last week. Be sober-minded, self-controlled. Be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, he's telling this after he's already told us to get rid of the things that we shouldn't be carrying because there's, a, there's an enemy that's looking to bring more into your life. And the more you try to carry, the more loaded you get down with. I mean, you just, you're under this burden of things because you refuse to cast it off. So in other words, wake up. Be alert. Get woke. Do something. All you young people. You're in a, you can't just kumbaya your way through this life. Thinking that, well, if I leave him alone, he'll just leave me alone. No, nope, that's not actually how it works. Your enemy is constantly walking around, checking to see if your doors are locked. I mean, just, he's looking for an opening. And then Peter gives us this, 
he gives us this description of how he works, which is actually very similar to the way that God described him working when he was describing sin in Genesis chapter four, talking to Cain. Look what he says in Genesis chapter four, God talking to Cain. If you do not do what is right, watch out because sin and Satan are synonymous. Sin is crouching at the door. Ready, again, analogy to the, so if you, don't, if you haven't seen it yet, um, cats, Satan. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. so I, I knew you were spirit discerning people. I knew that. <laughs> Crouching at the door, ready to pounce on you. Walking around, seeing if you left an opening for him. Satan and, and sin are synonymous, which means you can't just be sauntering. Whoa. <laughs> Unaware. No, he's described. He's predatory. He's hungry. He's dangerous. But here's the thing. He's roaring, but he's not biting. (laughs) Let me give you a tactic of of the enemy. He's all bark and no bite. He's a good roarer. Here's his MO. Here's his MO. He, He lies to us. That leads to fear, which leads to worry and anxiety. If you have problems with anxiety, you're believing a lie because you keep believing the roar. He just wants to get you afraid. And when he gets you afraid that your situation will never change, that you're in over your head, that the dream's never going to come true, that the odds are stacked against you, that your past disqualifies you, that your best days are behind you, that it's never coming. When you believe that lie, when he gets you to believe that, he's got you devoured. But here's, you get to choose because he doesn't have the the ability or the power to devour you unless you let him. So he has to scare you into a different reality. He's looking for someone that will believe the lie. Listen, he hates you with a venomous hate that you can't even imagine. He wants to devour you. And anything that God has placed in you, he hates. What's he want to devour? Your marriage. He loves divorce. He wants to devour your witness and your your testimony. He wants to take you. He wants to disqualify you from having any influence in people's lives. And he, he wants to devour your kids. He will take whatever he has to do. Pornography, drugs. He wants to devour your family. Do you understand the weight of what he's trying to tell us? And we leave doors and windows open all over our home. He loves debt and financial bondage. Loves it. Wants to destroy your fine. He wants to destroy your health. He loves sickness and pain. He wants to destroy you. He hates you. He wants to take you out. He wants to take your coworker out. He wants to take your family member out. He wants to take your classmate out. He's looking for someone that will believe the lie, that will live in the state of fear, that has anxiety and worry as the foundation of their life. And what you see with your natural eyes is not all there is. It, there's a spirit world. That is so very real. So, and, and have you ever noticed that it's at the point of vulnerability in your life, where, wherever you have sensed a weakness in your life, that that's where the temptation comes. That's, that's why Hebrews chapter 12 says, you've got to throw off the things that easily entangle you, that hinder you, because it's, those are the things that easily trip you up. And he knows those things. So you're trying to give up the party lifestyle and your friend shows up with the keg. And you're going, oh, great. Trying to purify your mind and that's when the image comes up on your phone. And you're you're trying to get out of debt and that's when they have a sale. You know, I mean, it's just whatever it is. Now, let me just give a disclaimer. Everything is not the devil. Let's not be the church that blames everything on the devil. Okay? Um, (laughs) <laughs> sometimes you need to stop casting out the devil and just have some self-control. Okay? 
<laughs> Peter said, be self-controlled and sober-minded. That means you can control yourself. That you keep dancing with the devil and wondering why you're still in hell. <laughs> I mean, there, there are some things that actually don't need a miracle. They just need discipline. So it's not, it's not always the devil, everybody. That dessert comes by, oh, here comes the devil. No, self-control. No, thank you. But the, de <laughs> the devil's setting traps, isn't he? Wherever you're weak, he attacks 2 Timothy chapter 2. Watch. Then they will come to their senses. You Listen, you got to wake up. Be alert. They'll come to their senses and escape from, he's setting a trap for you, which he uses to catch them whenever he likes. And then they can begin doing the will of God if they will escape from the trap. But you keep trying to do the will of God and still saying yes to the trap. You can't do it. The devil sets traps. He wants to take you captive. He blinds your mind from the truth. He deceives you. He robs and steals and chokes out the word from our lives. And he sets a trap to ensnare you into a lifestyle that's destructive. And you need to recognize you are in a battle. He's planning, plotting, scheming, measuring you for an opportune time, the Bible says. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that the, that this, the enemy attacks in mainly two areas. This is what I'm seeing in our society today. Mainly two areas. The first one is the home. Because if he can destroy the home, he has a bunch of orphans with no identity in Christ. Our, our most precious and needed relationships with the family, he will attack it. And then here's the second place where I just see it's the next generation. You want to know the greatest battlefield in our world today? It's in the campuses. Our kids are going to the greatest spiritual warfare every day, and we send them out without even a blessing. Good luck! Even you put your hands on them, speak life over them, and declare the, the blood of Jesus over their minds and over their hearts, and like send them out with some help. We have an enemy who tries to steal, kill, destroy, okay? Which is why he says this in verse 9. First Peter chapter five, watch it. So resist, you've got, you're gonna have to resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world, all believers are suffering. So now he's been talking submission, submission, submission. And now he gets to the enemy and he goes, no, it's not submission, resistance. And then he encourages us. He encourages, this is encouraging to me. You're not the only one. Now, you can choose to be the only one. You can choose to isolate and you can choose to try to take it on yourself. But just because you choose to do it alone doesn't mean that you're the only one dealing with it. Which is why he then gives us more encouragement in verse 10. He goes on to say this, watch. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory, again, he's pointing us to the future. After you have suffered for a little while, he himself will restore you and make you strong, make you firm, make you steadfast. Verse 11, to him be the power. Another translation says, be the dominion both now and forevermore. And everybody said, amen, amen. You've suffered for a little while. Feels like forever, Dev. Here's what's really cool about that, you know, because he, he's not only going to do something in the future, but he actually can do something now right in the middle of it. So he is restoring. He is confirming. He is establishing. He is making you steadfast and he will restore you. He will confirm you. He will establish you in an imperishable and unfading eternity. Verse 12, last verse of the study, everybody. And my purpose, what? Watch, this is why he wrote it. That's why he wrote it. To encourage you. Because, because you're discouraged. And you're carrying around things that you shouldn't be carrying. And you refuse to cast it. So he's trying to and assure you to have confidence that what you are experiencing, God's grace is in the middle of it. 
for it. So, <laughs> hey, stand firm. Stand firm. And this is what the apostle would hope is ringing in your ears as we finish his letter. He's pointing us to this living hope, unfading, that one day will be revealed. Hey, put your hope there, friend. In the meantime, what you're experiencing, God's grace is in the middle of it. His grace is available to you as, as a part of what you're walking through. But you need to make the choice to stand. And in order, it goes against everything we think. In order to stand, you have to humble yourself. <laughs> I mean, in order to stand, you have to stop carrying the things that the world tells you you're strong enough to handle. Because the, the world keeps onloading <laughs> and we need to be offloading. We need, what do we, cast it, fling it, hurl it. So that just like when Jesus came riding into the city, you could invite him into your situation, into your life, into your family, into your marriage, into the stress, into the chaos, into the worry, into the fear. And come on, see Jesus riding into your situation on Palm Sunday. He's come on, invite him into your situation today. Come on, celebrate it. Invite him into the place where you are experiencing anxiety. Because, friend, that's the place where you don't think God can handle it. Our anxieties, they are the calling card of our self-reliance. So how do we stand firm? We cast the burden. We transfer the burden. And we humble ourselves and submit in Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, let's pray. Lord, Let's just bow our heads and let's just take a moment. God stopped me in my study time to ask you, what anxiety are you carrying, friend? What, what lie have you believed that's caused you to live out of fear. That's now consuming your life with anxiety and worry. If he gets you to believe the lie, he's devoured you. Friend, you are enough in him. You're enough in him. I mean, I... I just sense there's a lot of people here this morning who've been carrying things you just weren't designed to carry. And Jesus is coming riding into your life and he's just asking you to open the door and to fling it, hurl it, let go of it, cast it, let go of it, and never pick it up again. Different response today, but I just... And maybe that maybe this is too much for you or you know maybe this isn't what you feel comfortable with but I just I, I think it, it just requires a, a, a real step today we don't do this very often but if you, if you find yourself carrying things that are weighing you down if you're borrowing from the future and putting it in your present and if you're basically telling God I, I, I'm handling it because you can't because you just refuse to cast it and today oh you're you're so tired oh my goodness you're exhausted cast it let go of it and if that's you today I, just, I want you to stand I, I want you to take a step I want you to do something that requires just a tangible expression come on come on God stopped me in my study time for you this week come on cast it and just as an act of like come on just open your hands and 
See yourself letting go. See yourself casting it. See yourself releasing it to the one that can handle it. Come on. Come on all across this place. and Let's just extend our hands and receive his. Come on, let's just rest in his presence. He's here. He wants to bring peace. Peace has a name. Hope has a name. Victory has a name. It's Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. My life surrendered to you alone. There's no, no other place to take it. Come on. No higher place than the foot of the cross. He paid for it, friend. He paid for it. My sin and shame yeah. overcome by my Savior's words. My Jesus, my life surrendered to you alone. Let's sing it out. No higher place yeah. than the foot of the cross. Oh, let's release it to him. My sin yeah. and shame. 